thinks because you're a zombie, you don't know good coffee. Well, they're wrong. We have very active lifestyles. It's not all wandering the countryside aimlessly or scaring passing motorists. And we all love a good cup of joe. And there's only one brew that gets my seal of approval. Deadly Grounds Coffee is my guilty pleasure. Bold, robust, delicious. It's coffee that can wake the dead. <laughs> With over a dozen different roasts and flavors, Deadly Grounds can satisfy the most finicky of coffee addicts. The aroma is so intoxicating. It brings all of my neighbors out of the woodwork. Deadly Grounds Coffee. Coffee to die for and zombie approved. It's good to get a little deadly. Use the front door! Oh, they're so disgusting. Persons under 18 will not be admitted. Happy Wednesday. Y'all know what time it is, I think. Well, you all expected Leo, too. Leo, so, not here but you guys. Leo's not here, um, but I am. And so is this man. No, <laughs> I'm not here. I'm there. Over there. See? No? No. Happy Wednesday. Yeah. Happy. Second week of January, second yeah, show yeah. of January. We're just starting season five. Yeah, yeah. Try and come back in. I don't know what's going on. No sound. Okay. Um, well, we wait for our voices, voices in the sky. Voices in our heads, right? Voices in the sky. So right. who do we bring along with us? We got uh um we got Ta -da. Ta -da. Oh my gosh. It's it's me, Jar Jar from from uh the Dorkening. I'm here, I'm helping these guys out. It's going to be a great show. I don't know. Am I introduced? Oh, there's nobody to introduce. Well, he's having, uh, apparently, that was the voices in our head. He um, oh. he couldn't hear. He lost, oh, he lost his, um, he lost his uh, audio. Well, just his so, hearing. Hmm. Well, we lost, hear well that's, old, like that's that. old age. We all lose our hearing. You know? You know. So, so but he'll, be, well, he'll be back. In well, he time. is, he is back. Um. At least he already knows the rules. Right. And Jar Jar, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to bring him in to see if he has his uh, hearing, if he can hear us. So go ahead and introduce him real quick. Ladies and gentlemen, 
all the way from I don't know, but uh, from <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he was on my three sons and like a ton of other things that that may be small roles, but like still amazing, like Mr. Stanley Livingston. I screwed yeah, up guys. your name the first time. You did. See, it's good you had to go. Wow. You yeah. didn't get to hear it. <laughs> I didn't get to hear anything. I couldn't see anything. It, every time I do a show where there's something that happens before I come in, that's it. It goes away, and I got to dial back in. I don't know no. what that's all about, but here I am. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Can't complain. Been busy uh, since the beginning of the year. Uh, so nice. I'm off to a good start. Good, good. Where are you coming to us from? I'm in California, Southern California, out by Palm okay. Springs. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I right. used so, to lived in L.A. my whole life, so this is a new experience out here. That explains the problem. It's mm -hmm. L.A. It's California. Uh, that'll do it. Yeah. That, it's all that. It's all that. Crank quote, on the phone doesn't work as well out here. Right? Yeah, I was right. going to say, it's all that, quote, smog they claim. is it, It's blocking the airways out there. Yeah, we get hurricanes now, too, apparently. Right. Oh, really? Yeah, we had yeah. that last year. I think it was in May. Uh, hurricane came up right through the Gulf of California and uh, just kept on coming up right through the Coachella Valley. Wow. We just got smacked with like a foot and a half of snow where I live. We had snow here two days ago. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> like a very unusual. For us, uh, yeah, usually it's more like February, March. We'll get a couple of days of snow here. Huh. Come to California. It's the new New England. There you go. <laughs> right? Yeah, or California sitting where New England was, and it's probably down by Australia was or something. I don't know. I think oh, all these tectonic plates are shifting around. <laughs> I would definitely take the California sunshine here in New England anytime. Oh, yeah, right now. Our, our weather is actually, I think, the best of any place I've ever been. You know, we have cold days, but our cold days are more like, uh, you know, 58 degrees, 53 wow. degrees. Oh, that's our perfect. Hot, yeah, our warm exactly. Days usually don't get well, over we had 100. that here yesterday. There yeah. you go. Yeah. But it poured, it was raining the whole day. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So uh, the weather patterns are changing everywhere. Right. Global so warming. there you go, folks. We're, we're, we're doing weather reports tonight. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's, I guess, jump right into it. Right. Hey, uh, how, how did you get? I know you started off younger um, doing other stuff. I'm sorry, by the way. I, I only had two hours to prepare for this. Uh, I, I'm filling in for uh, another host that oh, decided okay. that couldn't make it tonight. Um, yeah, Leo. But. Uh, how did you get tapped for My Three Sons? Well, it was actually a pretty long road to My Three Sons. I started in the industry in 1955. My Three Sons didn't come along until 1960. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I started out as, uh, well, as a child actor. Uh, my mother took me to a swimming school in Hollywood and wanted me to learn how to swim. And the lady who ran the school was very publicity-minded and got a bunch of... Uh, publicity for swim school and because of that hollywood type people started bringing their kids there to learn how to swim producers casting directors mm -hmm. agents and there was an agent there who represented children and she thought you know it's pretty extroverted and cute and she thought i'd make a good candidate to be a child actor so um she kept pressing my mom my mom finally relented and you know i started out as most actors do i was an extra uh, on some shows where I was just a neighborhood kid, didn't have any lines and just mixed in with a bunch of other kids. And uh, I guess that about a year of that. And then I did uh, an episode of Ozzy and Harriet for which I was cast again as an extra. Yeah. And uh, the storyline was Ozzy was selling Christmas trees in his backyard to make extra money. And he has a prospective client out there. And the joke was it looked like a, a mini forest in his backyard. And lo and behold, about six, seven kids come marching out of this forest with backpacks, sleeping bags, and we kind of walked <laughs> off. Anyway, I don't know why Ozzy picked me out and called me to the side and said, hey, I want you to say this line. He told me what to say. He said, when you get right to this spot, I'm going to put an X on the floor. Don't look at the X. Look right at me and say the line right to me and then turn right and go out of frame. So I did that, and they moved the camera in closer, did a, did a close-up, and uh, – yeah, at the end of the day, he went up to my mom and said, geez, I really liked him, and I'd like to have him back again. Please leave your contact information with my secretary. 
in the front office and uh, you know whoever thinks any producer or director is going to call you back that just doesn't happen but in this case it did about a couple months later my agent got a call they were looking for a neighborhood kid again in Ozzy and Harry and he called on me and I went in and this time I had a bunch of lines so uh, and also because of that first line that I got on camera I was able to join the Screen Actors Guild so Ah. Uh, at the age of six, I was actually a card-carrying member of the Screen Actors Guild and a professional actor. So between 1956 and 1960, I probably did 15 episodes of, uh, of Ozzie and Harriet. Did a bunch of other period shows that I can't even remember the name mm -hmm. of back in those days. Started doing movies. I did a movie, I think it was in 1957, uh, called The Bonnie Parker Story with Dorothy Provine. It was an early Bonnie and Clyde movie. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was made to be double billed with Machine Gun Kelly with Charles Bronson. So uh, it ended up in a lot of drive in theaters and it was a double bill in regular theaters. Uh, and then while I was doing Ozzy nice. and Harriet, there was a, a, another show shooting across from us that had a dog. It was a Basset Hound. And I was a dog person. So on my breaks or during the lunch hour, when they would open up the big stage door, I'd go wandering over there and play with this dog uh, whose name was Cleo. And uh, he was actually a cast member of the show uh, across from us. <laughs> anyway, one day I was you know, just talking to the dog, talking to the trainer. And this guy came up to me in a suit and said, who are you and what are you doing here? And I thought I was in trouble. <laughs> And he said there to talk to me, uh, you know, for probably about 10 minutes. So, yeah, you know, it almost felt like an interview. And then he said, gee, you know, I'd like to meet your mom. And I go, hey, uh, am I in trouble? And he said, no, no, you're not in trouble. He goes, but I would like to meet your mom. So I took him uh, across the street to stage five where my mom was waiting for me. Uh, you know, she was my guardian and in her said, hey, mom, this guy wants to meet you. And anyway, I kind of moved out over into the shadows thinking I probably was in trouble. And this guy was going to say, Hey, you can't bring your, or leave your kid wandering around the studio lot or on another stage. But anyway, what it turned out to be was uh, the guy that I brought over and I didn't know this. He was just, you know, an adult to me was Jackie Cooper, who was a major film star, probably in the thirties and forties. He and Shirley mm -hmm. Temple were the two big stars. Mm -hmm. The show that they were shooting across us was a show called People's Choice, which he was the star of and the producer and director on. And somehow, uh, I guess, meeting me made a light bulb go off in his head. About three months later, he wrote a pilot, TV pilot for me. And it was based on a movie that he did in 1931, for which he was nominated for an Academy Award. Uh, the director won the Academy Award. It was a movie called Skippy. Yeah. So he took the basis of this TV pilot uh, out of Skippy and kind of tweaked it a little bit for TV and hired me as Skippy. My name was above the title. And um, anyway, we oh, shot awesome. it in December of 1958. And uh, it didn't sell. And uh, I never saw it till very recently. But I always wondered how it turned out. Uh, about three years ago, I ran into somebody contacted me on Facebook and I recognized the name. And it was the name of the guy who played my best friend at Skippy. So, you know, we were called him up and we we're chit chatting. And I said, did you ever see Skippy? And he says, oh, yeah, and no, I've seen it dozens of times. I said, well, how did you see it? Because uh, I don't even have a copy. I never saw it. I went to Jackie Cooper's house at least twice. Rummaged. We rummaged through his attic, through his um, garage, and he couldn't find the 16 millimeter printer. Well, he said, I've got a DVD. So I went, oh, wow. <laughs> so turned okay. out he was turned out he was coming down to Palm Springs in December. So about three four months later, he gave me a call and we hooked up, had lunch, came back to my place, and I finally saw Skippy, which uh, was didn't realize what an important stepstone that was in my career. Because what happened back then was after we made the thing and it wasn't going anywhere, it didn't seem like it was going to sell. And I think Jackie Cooper went on to another TV series called Hennessy. Um. It was a good show piece. And so my mm. agent was sending it to producers. That's how I ended up in uh, Please Don't Eat the Daisies with Doris Day and David Niven. I don't think it had any impact uh, when I did Rally Around the Flag Boys with Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward. And then some other things that I did in that era. You know, So it was a real convenience. You know how actors say, I have a reel. 
Well, yep. today, you know, what they were talking about like 20 years ago was that they'd send your videotape in and the casting person or the director or producer would watch it. Then it became a DVD and now it's all file based or you go to your actor's access thing and watch your reel. In those days, it was actually a reel uh, of 16 millimeter film. Uh, the way you showed it was you would rent a theater after midnight when the real movies that were playing that day were over. You'd pay the projection to stay there and people would come and see it, uh, you know, mainly industry people who were interested in casting me. And uh, somewhere around 1959, uh, there was a, a series that was about to be and they were looking for a young person, a young son to be in it. And uh, anyway, uh, my agent said, then over. you must have felt like an old man. <laughs> uh, I was. Yeah. When I look back you went it, through I everything. Old. I did. I did. Well, Early anyway, it's season. real. Real got sent over to Desi Lu, which is where Don Federson Productions was. And they saw this piece of film on me. And next day, they made an offer for me to be hired on My Three Sons. And uh, at that point in time, I was a pretty well known commodity for TV and, uh, you know, for potentially in movies. And uh, I was actually up for a movie at that same period of time. And, and they offered that to me. So as luck would have it, my agent was killed in a, in a car crash. Like oh, while all this was wow. happening. Yeah. As my, luck would have it? <laughs> well, bad, bad luck for her, bad luck for me too, almost. But what happened uh, was I, I ended up with another agent that we really didn't know, but she came with, she was a very well-known agent, but she took me. And, uh, you know, we had to rely upon her what to take. I was up for a movie called, well, it was the Huckleberry Finn remake. And I think oh, it was right. starring Tony Randall, but I would have been Huckleberry Finn. Oh, anyway, okay. my agent suggested I take the series. Uh, I'm sure it was, you know, not a lot of self-interest there. She was probably looking at the uh, Huckleberry Finn go, hmm. TV series, 39. <laughs> so she suggested I take the series. And it was the right, it turned out to be the jackpot. You know, it's a right. series starring Fred McMurray. It was unheard of that a movie star of his caliber was even going to be involved in a TV series. Yeah. outside of doing an occasional guest spot on the Lucy show. But uh, he was. Mm -hmm. And because of that, the ABC network handled that show with kit gloves and Fred McMurray with kit gloves. And it went on the air and it became kind of an instant hit and who knew it was going to run for 12 years and almost 400 episodes yeah, yeah that's anyway, pretty amazing that's how i got into showbiz <laughs> wow. other shows half of which i can't remember anymore wow so he answered like a bunch of my questions <laughs> all the way up to that that one hey, question that jar jar asked one question. i know uh, well oh, pretty good you guys can answer can ask some questions I, well i was gonna too, say i know? mean like you got you like you said you got your start um in what they actually called a group called the water babies yes you know which is something thrown together by the proprietor of the swim school right and it, and it worked what she did is she had a huge swimming pool it was right on the hollywood boulevard just the east of western and my mom sent me there to learn how to swim so i, I was there from the time i was two years old and you know another case of right place right time and mm -hmm. uh so she cut a porthole you know below grade in the side of the pool it was really kind of fascinating you went down these steps that were on the uh, walkway around the pool and there was a little room down there and it was about a three foot uh, piece of glass put in it's probably five inches thick to keep the water pressure out but photographers could go down there and shoot underwater pictures of us kids so she would put cars and bikes and swings and, you know, just to make it look interesting. And we'd be under there like we were living our aquatic life. Hmm. And, uh, you know, she ended up in a lot of magazine, period magazines, Look, Life, Vogue, uh, wow. came out and covered it. Uh, there was a show called You Asked For It on in those days. Mm -hmm. And uh, somebody asked for it. It, it was probably her. <laughs> but <laughs> they came out, brought a camera. And shot us kids in that. I mean, besides that, too, I, I, I was learning how to high dive. So I was diving off this diving platform, which was probably about 15 feet high, which you get up there and you look down and go, I don't want to do that. But, you know, you finally conquer your fears and learn how to do it. In fact, interesting, uh, this is probably when I was about seven, maybe eight, I, I was studying diving with a, a, an Olympic diving instructor. 
but not at the this pool. There was another place called the Hollywood Athletic uh, Club that had an indoor pool that also had this amazingly high platform. And that's where I would learn how to swim. Anyway, the guy who was there learning, and he was ahead of me, uh, how to swim was Tony Dow. So I knew Tony all oh, the way wow. from the time I was about seven years old, and neither one of us was you know, in show business, I guess you could say we we're on the periphery of it. But uh, yes. you know, a couple of years later, he got cast as Wally. And mm -hmm. I started uh, doing those Ozzy and Harriet's, which was the trajectory to, to where I ended up. That's very hmm. cool. Well, now your brother was also in uh, My Three Sons too, right? Yeah, yeah, he was in My Three Sons. He was actually also uh, rally around the flag boys with me. But oh, just okay. just briefly, uh, I went out on the interview and you know, there was a bunch of kids and they got it whittled down to three of us. And I think we met the director. And then the next thing I found out was I had it and they asked me to wait. So my mom, you know, was the person that brought me there. And my little brother was tagging along. Uh, he was pretty young then. And uh, so the casting person was talking to my mom and he said, well, who's this other little boy? And she said, well, that's Stan's brother, Barry. And so he said, hmm, we're looking for a little brother, too. He'd be perfect. Is he an actor? And so she just said, well, yeah. Sure and is. And so he got hired. And uh, anyway, the first day of shooting, the director was Leo McCary. I don't know if that rings a bell, but he was a famous director, especially probably at the apex of his career about this time. But he was the guy that originally put Laurel and Hardy together mm -hmm. as a team and um you know wrote a lot of their their films but uh he was directing this movie so our directorial challenge was to sit there and watch a tv set and when paul newman came in the door behind us and talked to us to ignore him and just focus on the tv set so we shot it once or twice and then the director came up to my brother and said you're not looking at the tv set you're looking over here i need you to look over here and so Barry went, okay, and we did it again, came back out, came the same direction. We did this about three or four times and I could start seeing steam coming out of this guy's head. And uh, by noon, um, they took Barry to an ophthalmologist, found out he had crossed eyes. So it was <laughs> never gonna look like he was looking at that TV set. Anyway, by one o'clock, I had a brand new brother and we shot the scene over uh, with some guy <laughs> named Ralph Osborne. So my <laughs> Poor brother, that was his first experience in show business, and he got <laughs> fired. But it was a very fortuitous firing because he ended up getting glasses because it would change his whole appearance. You know, mm -hmm. every little kid, and his hair was more blonde back then, so he, you know, looked a little bit alike. But it gave him this whole new glasses look, and then about a year or two later, is he got buck teeth. He kind of had. I don't well, the Mr. Moto look basically, <laughs> especially when he got a Mo Howard haircut. And but he was darling looking, and that actually broke the ice because most of the kids working back then look like me, or they all seem to have red hair. And mm. Barry kind of pioneered this quintessential nerd look for being a little kid. And he'd do all kinds of parts where he was supposed to be uh, intelligent, a brain, or a scientist, or whatever, and uh, that looked really worked for him so you know he milked it cool. he ended up doing some movies after that he was in uh the Aaron boy with jerry lewis he had that great what? scene do you remember the movie where he went up and got the jelly beans down he worked in mm. the uh i think it was part of the restaurant and there's three kids that come up to jerry lewis and there were some jelly beans in this giant glass mm. urn so he had to pull the ladder up go up so he asked the first kid what do you want he said i'd like to have 10 cents worth of those jelly beans sir goes up the ladder and goes through all kinds of machinations to get to it and is struggling to carry this you know huge volume of jelly beans down scoops out 10 cents worth gets it to him goes back up the ladder puts it up there and then he goes the next day what would you like hmm. oh i'd like 10 cents worth of those jelly beans sir so you saw i, mean, I do remember that went up and yeah. down and finally puts it up and so he looks at barry and he says I, I guess you'd like 10 cents of those jelly beans too and he says no, sir. He goes, I like, and so he goes back up and gets the thing. He goes, I like five cents worth of those jelly beans. And then Jerry Lewis goes off on him. It was, it was cute, cute little skit. Right. I, I do vaguely remember that. Yep. Yeah. What so, was uh, school like for you guys back then? Did you guys go to like private schooling or did they have like on the lot schooling? Well, yeah, well that was kind of interesting for us. We were um well what what happened for me was we had a tutor when we were shooting and i'd have to put in three hours 
a day, no matter how I got it in there, even if it was in 15 minute increments, uh, I'd be in school, then called out to work, come back do another 15. And sometimes that could last from eight in the morning till four in the afternoon. Oh, Christ. Um, yeah. So it was kind of weird. And then some days I'd come in and I wasn't needed till, you know, like 11 o'clock. So I'd come in at eight by 11. I was through with my schooling and had done the day school. Um, but in between seasons, Barry and I were one of the few kids that actually went back to public school. Oh, no uh, most of the kids in show business went to a place called Hollywood Professional School, which was on Hollywood Boulevard. And, uh, you know, most of the kids stars of that era all went there. Uh, even people in the music industry. I know David, David Marks from the Beach Boys, he went there. Huh? Almost everybody that you saw on TV went there. And, for some reason, our, our parents decided they didn't want us going to be with just child actors all day and talking about our careers and probably having your head swell up, you know, mm-hmm. you get full of yourself. So they said, you guys are going to public school. You just have to deal with it. So we did. And yeah, it was, you know. I think that first, was the right move, actually. Right. It was. It was, even though we were reticent about it. But, you know, having looking back on it, that was the right thing to do. And it, it, it was tough, though. I got to tell you, you know, kids are less understanding than adults. Yeah. And I, my friends, because I went to the same school, but all of a sudden, here's this guy going to school and he's on TV. It's like, well, why are you on TV? And, um, you know, I had explained that I had an agent and, you know, uh, it was getting me work and it, you know, didn't make any sense to them. So it was either a case of kids loving you or hating you. <laughs> that's the way it worked. Mm-hmm, right. You know, they wanted to be your friend or they wanted to kill you. That's kind of how it, how it came out. So, and that was the case all through high school. Yeah. There were people that, you know, cozied up and wanted to be friends and some of them turned it into real friends and others were just friends for the moment when they met me and, and then other ones were like, you know, see you after school. Don't make me come get you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> I know. But there's a there's a lot of tragedies that you know have come out of child actors and. You know, uh and, yes, there you is. Know, yeah, you know, I probably it's, it's so know. unfortunate. You know, a lot of those people had yeah, bad life. Yeah. You know, I don't think it's so much the experience of actually being in the industry. It's it's how your parents relate to you, and it really depended on the kind of parents you have and how sensible they were, or whether they were putting you in the show business so they had another revenue stream, and you know we're going to end up taking all your money, and they just looked at you as chattel. Uh, yeah. You know, our parents were really good, and you know we always had the option that if we didn't want to do it anymore at any point, we could always tell them. And, we didn't have to do it anymore, but it was kind of in my blood all the way from the time I started school, you know, when I was mm. in kindergarten, uh, first grade, I always wanted to be in those shows, you know, that they had in the auditoriums. And I guess my parents, I gravitated towards mm. that and uh, I was getting the part. So they thought, well, and then that opportunity came along with the agent to kind of take it to another level. And they were with it. And, you know, when we were making good money, uh, my parents weren't taking the money. Most of it was put into a uh, trust fund for me for when I was supposed to turn 21, although that ended up changing to 18 at some point. And, uh, yeah, so good parents. Uh, yeah, right. When I was a kid, I, I did one play when I was a little kid. Uh, that. Never, never again. <laughs> Hated it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> not for people me. either love it or they don't like it. They like performing or they like the adulation and people clapping for them. You know, just or some kids are shy and they don't really want to be in front of people. You know, you, you really have to find your place there. You know, this goes even for today for people wanting to do this. Uh, right. You know, I think people get into it for the wrong reasons. You know, they look and go, "Well, I I could be rich or I could go to these parties or I'll have a mansion or I'll have a Lamborghini." And that's their motivation. That that never works out, you know. And if no, it does, no. you got to do it because you want to do it. Because yeah, it. yeah, right. You, you you love the work, and you would do it even if you're doing it for free. Because a lot of times you will be doing it for free. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Well, so okay. outside of just acting, you've done just about everything in the industry. You've done some directing, producing, editing, special effects, writing. But I want to go past that to way back when you were about eleven years old. You actually mm-hmm. were a singer. <laughs> well, thanks for saying that. Um, <laughs> well, like singer wannabe? 
Uh, well, no, I, no, I, I mean, saying I can't no. say I was yeah. a singer, but it was during that era. <laughs> well, where, you know, people on TV, especially teenagers on TV, were being offered a chance to record a record. Um, Paul Peterson had my dad, which was a great song, and my can't find her, her she can't find her keys. Johnny Crawford uh, had a song out. Uh, Shelley Fabre had Johnny Angel, and uh, you know, I I consider Lee Shelley's song probably the most realistic real song i mean you know had she not been on tv that song would have been a hit even the way she did it, it would have been a hit and she was great uh well i got offered hairspray yes <laughs> so right there you knew it was a novelty song you know it's kind of like the flying purple people eater but that got more play <laughs> uh yeah so we you know i went into a studio and the producers recorded that and uh, i think it sold two copies. I think my mom and my dad were the people that bought the two copies. <laughs> but it got uh, them on the airplane. Lo and behold, it became a number one hit. Yeah. Didn't say much for that, but in uh, Stockton, California, which is where they right, love right. cat cattle on the trains or something there. I don't know what they do. I but will it, say know, this: very though, world it time. made it into the top twenty in in Boston. So it, yeah, it did. I, I've heard that over the coast years, to in coast place. It, it yeah. you know was a novelty song. Anyway, you know, huh. to be fair, it was cute, and um, yeah, you know, so it was just a weird episode. I remember I went to Stockton and I did a show, a live show with with Shelley Fabre, uh, with Dwayne Eddy, the Guitar Man, uh, Eddie Hodges, and it was somebody else. I can't remember who the fifth person was, but I remember Shelley and I were totally terrorized because we like. I don't sing live, you know, so like, oh, no, you don't have to do that. We put the record on in the back and it goes out through the PA and you just lip sync it. You look like you're singing what they would call Millie Vanilli, you know, style. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Millie vanilli this song and I'll go, God, please, God, don't let that record stick. You know, we keep repeating itself. But somehow I made it through, Shelly made it through, even Dwayne Eddy, he didn't lip sync, he guitar sang. And the only person that sang live was Eddie Hodges. He had brought music with him. They put that music on, and uh, he had a microphone. And, man, he could sing. He, he was a real singer. In fact, he was in the movie A Hole in the Head with Frank Sinatra. Wow. And uh, I think he did the song with Frank Sinatra. Uh, I, I, what was it called? Uh, something about an ant can't uh, move a rubber tree plant. Oh, High Hopes. He's got high hopes. Anyway, okay. that was yeah. Eddie and yeah. that song. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, he's pretty good. I, I, I just good happened guy. to read. Yeah, I just happened to read that, and I'm like, oh, I have to bring that up because that's one of those things that, like, yeah, all, all child actors or somebody that's recorded that one song, they go, <laughs> oh. yeah. So at least it's not as bad did. as as like Corey Feldman, who actually believes <laughs> he's like a rock star and stuff. Uh, yeah, but, I, well, I probably thought I was too. You know, all of us guys <laughs> my age got. 19 end of 1963 our whole world changed because the beatles came out in december of 63 or january of 64 i was standing in line at sears to buy meet the beatles and next day after that i had my beetle boots and i didn't want to cut my hair anymore you know so <laughs> i only cut it when i went back to work so i, I was a convert it was like a cult and you know i went out bought a guitar it's dumb i didn't know what kind of guitar to buy so i went to a pawn shop and uh you know any guitar looks good if you don't know what you're doing so yeah. I one off the wall the frets are about the, i mean the strings are about that high off the frets <laughs> and the neck the neck was about six inches wide it was a, it was a um a, what do you call it? metal string classical guitar so about three days later later my fingers were all bleeding you know, i didn't oh, know anything but i learned how to play on that guitar so about a year later somebody said well you should buy like a real guitar you know be a little bit easier to play so went to wallach's music city in hollywood and i bought a fender mustang Ooh, which your hands wow. off yeah yeah tapered <laughs> neck you know the strings were mm -hmm. slinky they didn't abuse your fingers and they were you know one nano off the fret so you it wasn't a struggle to <laughs> bring those strings down to the fret to make the noise so when i had that yeah fender mustang Oh, wow, for about 10 years. About two years later, I bought a Gibson 335 cherry body mm. guitar. And, eh, it was pretty good, you know, as, as a guitarist back then. And can't say you I was a play? great singer. No, I, I had to give it up. When I was about 18, 19, I guess it was, uh, my daughter was born. 
And it was a choice of, do I want to be up all night because the guitar is waking her up or do I want to sleep? So, and I decided, you know, I better really kind of focus on what I was going to do. So got rid of the guitars, bought cameras and, uh, you know, editing equipment. And I go, man, you know, I better learn how to do this. This is kind of where I'm known. I'm never going to be John Lennon, Paul McCartney. I'm, you know, I don't even think I'm going to be uh, uh, Tiny Tim. So, yeah, I made my move. Okay. My, my brother's like still it. doing it. Barry he? plays professionally. Yeah. Yeah. He's plays probably almost every week in a club somewhere. He tries out new songs and he and his wife, his wife's a singer as well. They're both, you know, really, really good. And his son is amazing. Yeah. He, he's really perfect. They've cut about probably about six, seven albums by now. Uh, wow. His name is Spencer and his wife's name is Alex. They just got married. They've been together about five years, and yeah, they're a group known as Living More, and now they're known all over LA. Yeah, you know, they play wow. everywhere. Yeah, yeah. No kidding. Yeah. I well, you can that. find them on the internet. Look up Living More. You'll be surprised. Well, I'll, 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 I just wrote it. it down. I, I'll, yeah, I just wrote it down. <laughs> you know, because that's those are the types of stories that we love to bring on the show. Mm -hmm. It's not just you know the famous actor or the famous actress. Um, a lot of other shows that we've done are people that have written books that nobody knows anything about. You know what I mean? Um, we, yeah. we find interesting stories. Yeah. Um, well, you know, and, when you're in this profession, that's what you got to do. You got to open the hood and look below the surface. It's like oh, opening yeah. up a Corvette and finding out there's a Ford engine in there or something, or a Jaguar or the right, Chevy right. engine. Yeah. You know? It's like, wow, how did that happen? It so, sounds like you've had a pretty like nice little like stroll through through uh, not celebrityhood but like acting hood. Like mm -hmm. you, you, any roles that you went up for that you you really wanted that you didn't get? Yeah, yeah. You know, it was it was difficult for me. Uh, well, for every actor who was on a TV series and was a known quantity, and you know, in a sense, was stereotyped. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, when my three sons, I was anxious for it to end so I could, uh, you know, go on with my career or whatever that was going to be. No kidding. And uh, went out on some interviews, and you know, a lot of times I wouldn't get hired because you'd walk in, they go, "Chip, well, I don't want Chip in my movie." You know, it's uh, like when this character walks on, it's kind of like what happened to George Reeves way back mm, in the fifties. Yeah, after mm. he had done Superman. Uh, it was very difficult for him to get work, you know. In fact, I think he was in a movie that's kind of in the biography about him, and they were screening it for some people. And, and when he walked in, I think it was supposed to be Gladiators, and all of a sudden somebody goes, look, it's Superman, you know. And just kind of jarring and stopped the movie, and they had to cut the scene, and cut him out of the scene, and, you know, it really kind of wrecked his career. Well, I was sort of a victim of that too. It, it either worked for you. Fortunately for me, there was B movies, and those are the type of people that would hire you know, the Roger Corman, Gene Corman, anybody making a low budget movie saw the sense in in having some known quantity, even if, if you weren't a you know movie star. But the biggest problem of all was the the casting people. Um, you know, they really were. I guess the gatekeepers of getting yeah. into the movie industry. Mm -hmm. And if you were known for TV, they really they didn't even want to see you, you know, most of the time. And wow. I remember I made a, a big mistake. I wanted to be in this movie because I read the book. And I, I mean, the description of the book was me. So I called my agent. He couldn't get me on this interview. It was a big movie, too. And um, so I called uh, a, a a director, uh, not a director, I'm sorry, an attorney who was a friend of mine that I knew could make a call and get me seen by this casting director, a guy named Lynn Stallmaster, who cast everything. And this is dumb of me to do, but you know, you learn your lessons too, and even if you've been around a while. What, what happened was he, I guess, this guy called the producer, ordered Lynn Stallmaster to see me on an interview, and I came out, and he just, you know, let me read and it said thank you and then i walked out and <laughs> right then and there I thought i'm never going to be called on a lens stall master because i went above his head forced him to see me and i think that was a case where they didn't want that to happen in this film and anyway the film was called the last detail it starred jack nicholson 
and uh-huh. uh, they were two SPs looking for an AWOL uh, sailor. Mm. And uh, even though the description in the book uh, was a description of me, height, weight, hair, you know, just kind of all-American looking guy, they went completely in a different direction. And um, the guy that did the part was brilliant and he's goofy and had a big career after this movie. Uh, it was Randy Quaid. Wow. No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So completely different direction. Right. And, um, you know, but mm-hmm. I, I kind of signed my own death warrant there with Lynn. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I never saw him again to apologize to him, but you know, when you're 21, oh. 22, you're, and that was one reason I kind of, you know, wanted to move into behind the camera. Right. Really, I really never liked that process, even though that is the process. And if you're doing it today, that is the process. But what, what happens is, um, you know, I, I got tired of just sitting there waiting for the phone to ring with my agent saying, okay, go here tomorrow, you know, to Absolutely send you a script today sense. and doing all that. So you're just waiting around a lot, kind of waiting for luck to happen. And that really wasn't, who I thought I was, you know, I, I wanted to make things happen and make the calls myself and talk to people. And as an actor, you can't really call people, um, you know, but mm. if you're another producer director, you can call anybody and talk to them, you know, just don't ask for a bar, but you can talk about the business and directing or whatever you need from them. But mm. if you're an actor, it's just unacceptable to do that. You know, just this, you know, line, a demarcation line between actors and everybody else. I don't want to hear from you unless they want you. Are there any roles that you did that you wish you didn't? No, I can't say that. Um, There was, you know, a couple things in My Three Sons that I I wish I would have been more vocal about. We did an episode where Chip had long hair. Mm -hmm. And it's it's pretty well-known episode. Uh, And it was kind of bowing to the fact, I guess it was probably about 1965, 66, where kids were growing their hair long, you know. I mean, when I grew I lived in Hollywood, but I had buddies of mine, you know, as soon as they said the final cut at the end of the season, we wrapped, my hair started growing. And I had my hair pretty long. But I had friends whose dads were like, you're not getting a haircut like that. They had like, looked like they just came out of the Navy, you know, and they were really not liking it and having fights and stuff. Anyway, we did an episode where our parents, you know, were frowning on the fact that we, had long hair and, and, you know, was always the My Three Sons way where Fred's character, Steve, uh, you know, without wishing that I didn't have it, but never going to come out and say, hey, you got to cut your hair, you know, a demand and was hoping that I would do it on my own. That's always, that was the premise of every show. He never really made us do things. He just hoped that he instilled in us the qualities and the attributes where we would recognize we were making a mistake and then do the right thing. So. I, I was okay with that. And and that year I had long hair and had to come in and get my hair cut to do my three sons. And, you know, it was kind of short still, uh, you know, for, you know, when, when I was doing the show, but uh, the wig they got uh, was horrible. It looked like it, they must've robbed it from like Joan Blondell or something. It just <laughs> sat, it looked like a Siamese cat on my head. And I'm like, God, this is like, People don't have long hair like that. It was like curly, and I mean, it was just ridiculous. And uh, and the and the fact that I had just cut my hair, I'm like, why didn't we just shoot this out? You know, when I had the long hair, it was my hair, and it you know looked real, and you know it was kind of a great haircut. And meanwhile, I had to walk around with this thing uh, during the episodes. In fact, who else was in that episode? It was uh, Jay North, the guy that played Dennis the Menace, mm-hmm. oh, played no, my no. friends, and we were the two guys with this. I mean, it was, it, it, I can't even say it was white. I mean, blonde hair was like white. We look like, remember that movie, Village of the Damned? Yep. We look like two kids out of Village of the Damned. It was terrible. Um, anyway, that would have been a, an episode I would have preferred to not have been in. And it was, when I had to go back to school that year, I was, I was like humiliated. I just, you know, hope they would lose the reel and it would never air, but it did. And, <laughs> You know, guys came up to me and go, "Yeah, you look like a real a hole on that thing." You know, I'm like, "Hey, I, I just, I'm just an actor. They made me wear it. I didn't have anything to do with that." But yeah, there were there'd be things like that in in the show. Some of the episodes were just kind of cor- corny, but that was very sensitive to me because, you know, at that age, you just want to fit in, and you know, if other people have long hair and kids are starting to grow their hair long, you just 
want to fit in with that. That that's how it is when you're a teenager. Right. You, you don't want to be that one guy that you know does something weird nobody likes. So, but you know, with that thing on my head <laughs> and being on TV in front of sixty million people, that didn't help. Let's put it that way. Right. So I was angry about that. Um, but yeah, you know, most things that I've done, I, I was glad to do them because as an actor, you know, to get a job is just so hard. You got to go out and audition and, you know, there, when my two sons ended, <laughs> that was, well, that was a funny story. You know, I've been on a pretty much top 10, top 20 TV series for 12 years. So I was a known quantity and, uh, you know, I was kind of anxious to see what else was out there for me as an actor. but. When the series ended, yeah, you know, I figured I'd be getting like a movie offer, offer to be in another TV series, you know, pretty quick. And my agent called, said, "Do you want to take some time off?" And I said, "Well, maybe just just a couple of weeks." And so I did. And uh, so he called me, said, "You ready to go back to work?" And I went, "Yeah, yeah." I said, "You got something?" He said, "Yeah, yeah, I do." He says, "I got an interview for you tomorrow." And I'm thinking he's going to say, you know, another Jack Nicholson movie. No, it was a McDonald's commercial. And I'm thinking, <laughs> <laughs> wow, one day I was a TV star and now I'm doing a McDonald's card. So I, I thought, oh, okay, I'll do it. You know, I, I want to go out just because I got to get started somewhere because I'm back to square one is what was dawning on me. So I get to this room and there was about a hundred other guys that looked just like me, you oh, know, gosh. and had to learn wow. the lines and had to stand up and stand. And I think it was, I don't think I did a great job because I was more in shock of where I was or, you know, whatever I thought was going to come next. This wasn't it. I had to stand up there and hold a hamburger and go, ah, oh, you know, it's great. It's got a pickle and a lettuce and tomato mm. and, you know, all of the things they always would say about a McDonald's hamburger. I don't think my sincerity was there that day. I came <laughs> home and I remember flopping on the couch my wife going, what, what's wrong with you? I go, well, I just got my first interview. Just went out for a McDonald's other a McDonald's commercial with a hundred other guys. And uh, yeah, so how do you distinguish yourself? The hundred are the guys, but then yeah, right. I thought, okay, look, forget it. This is the route you chose, so you better get back to acting school or whatever you're going to do about it, and get serious about whatever's coming up. And you know, went out on a actually a Honda commercial a couple of months later, and I got it. And the same day, I went out on a Kemper's commercial, Kemper Insurance commercial, and I got that one. So I had two commercials that I nabbed in in one day. And the commercials were actually being cast in this in the same building with different people. But so my agent calls out. He says, "Well, you got a problem." He goes, "You got them both, and they both shoot on the same day." So he goes, "Do you ride a, a motorcycle better than you ride a horse?" And I said, "No, I probably ride the horse better than the motorcycle." So I ended up taking this Kemper insurance commercial, and I had a <laughs> ride on the back of a horse. I wasn't really riding on the horse, and that was. That was the problem. I knew how to ride a horse really well, but I was supposed to jump up and back of the guy who was in the saddle and hang on for dear life. But we shot that all day long. And lo and behold, I found out at the end of the day, a lot of those stunt guys got hurt. The saddles were, the cinches were breaking and they were falling off. And the very last shot I was in, I thought I was done. They knocked on the on my dressing room trailer and said, oh, we want, the director wants to get one more shot of you coming at the camera. And then you turn and we whip pan around and you guys are riding the horses into the sunset and it's coming up. So get out of here right now. And so we did. And so as we're shooting, when the horse would turn and make that turn, the inertia would make me go that way. And it was because I didn't have any kind of stirrups to push back on. So one of the guys would kept butting me with his shoulder to get me back up straight. And so he did. But the guy in front of me that had the reins and had the Kemper insurance flag, <laughs> he starts yelling at me, jump, jump. He goes, the cinch just broke. The saddle's going. So the saddle's going. Oh, no. Yeah. So I just went like that, went over backwards and landed on the ground. And I literally almost tore all my clothes off. Fortunately, I wasn't hurt. That guy, I think, wow. broke his arm or a couple of fingers. And oh, wow. it wasn't until later in the day I found out they were demanding stunt pay or something because yeah, a lot of people got hurt. And, yeah, it was a pretty wild day shoot. But lo and behold, that that little insurance commercial, uh, you know, if you can get a good commercial back in those days, you, you can make $100,000 in a year and not work for one day's work because they paid so well if it was a national commercial. Well, wow. this this was a national commercial, but it only played during uh, tennis season. That's what these felt. So I think it was from January, February, March, like April or something. 
and you know, it didn't sound like a lot in that day. I made my day's pay, but I ended up making, I think it was $15,000 a year. So that would have been 60 had they run it all year long, maybe more uh, for 10 years. Wow. Five days work. Yeah. Yeah. That's fan freaking fantastic. Mm. Yeah. That's what they call royalties. Smart. Royalties, residuals, take, yes. The take the residuals. residuals, folks. Take the residuals. It, it's well, funny those, those that days they were worth something, though. <laughs> right. It, it's funny that it was such an unsafe thing since it was an insurance commercial. I know. <laughs> That's what I said to the guy when I was, you know, they saw me fall off, the other guy fall off, and all the other horses turned around, kind of were coming back. We're still laying on the ground there. <laughs> I wasn't really in pain, but I remember the um, the guy from the commercial agency came up and he's like looking. He goes, "Are you okay?" And I said. Is it too late to buy any of that insurance? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Oh, well, that's too funny. Yeah, so I mean, the worst the worst part of it actually was I wasn't really hurt from the fall, but from having, you know, riding on a horse all day. If you oh, haven't done imagine. that, I couldn't walk for three days. I was like walking bow leg and it, it, my inner thighs are just killing me, man. Oh, God. That was like horrible pain. Right. Bruised tailbone. Oh, the whole, yeah. Yeah, the whole yard. Yeah. <laughs> do that for fun. I can't believe it. <laughs> right. So, so, so what do you get coming up? Yeah, I was just going to say that. Uh, well, I've been working on this project actually for an, a number of years, and it's been up once. Um, I did a um, – well, it's, uh, it's a documentary as far as the screen actors is concerned. But what it is, it's an educational documentary, and it's for actors, uh, but it has nothing to do with acting. So people go, well, what could that be? You know, and anyway, so to describe it, uh, there's acting schools all over. You know, if you're going to become an actor, you, you know, start somewhere either at a mom and pop local acting school and you have a teacher. You go to junior college, college, university, you go to New York, you go to the Actors Academy or wherever you want to go. There's acting schools everywhere. And they're really good at training actors in the art and craft of acting. The problem for actors, and this has been a, an historical thing, is that there is just never been a, a program or a course you could take on the business side of being an actor. And almost anything you do in life is kind of a two component, you know, mm -hmm. deal. You know, if you're a chef and you love to cook and you have great recipes, well, that that's well and good. And you've got that down. You know how to run a restaurant sign leases and the equipment and you know, all that. Mm -hmm. So you can be the best chef in the world, but if you don't know how to run a business, uh, you're going to be out of business. And it's so true for actors. Uh, it's so deceptively simple. It looks like you're just going to be doing acting, but there's this other side, you know, what are called the non-performance skills or the business side of the industry that uh, really elude everybody because there is no program. There is no book. Um, you know, the, the few things that are out there is get a reel, get a resume, try and get an agent, try and get a Screen Actors Guild. And when actors accomplish that, they think they're done. Anyway, I put this program together. It covers about 65 topics. And it's not me teaching it. Um, I decided to bring in just about everybody I either worked for or worked with. So I bought uh, over 100 people from the entertainment industry to teach the program. Wow. It's not just actors, but I brought in directors, agents, managers, talent managers, talent agents, casting directors. I brought in the president of the Screen Actors Guild, the president of the Directors Guild of America, and they all teach this uh, program that's dedicated to the business side of being an actor and what you need to know. So you have the opportunity to go out there and do it for yourself and reinvent the wheel. And that'll probably take you 10 years. That's just normally how long, if you even learn it at all, because it just depends on the experiences you're going to have. Or sometimes you make mistakes and you're in the business and then you're right back out, never to get back in again. Or, you know, like I said, this is a 10 hour program and you can sit there and watch it. You know, you can binge watch it or you can watch it over the period of week and learn from people who've got 20 years worth of experience. Uh, that have been there and done it and are really divulging everything that they did that worked to you. So you can take that and implement it for yourself. Mm -hmm. In fact, over 50 of these people have either won or been nominated for Academy Emmy and Golden Globe Awards. So wow. yeah. uh, I call them the horse's mouth. Anyway, it's a project Amazing. called The Actor's Journey. Uh, we're just getting ready to relaunch it. I've got everything almost done on it. The website's built, but not up yet, not visible. And we're just uploading the video right now. And once it's up and tied together with our website, then people can go there and 
you know, start watching, uh, start watching the segments that are there. And, you know, they're, you know, reasonably inexpensive. I think they're $5 an episode or something like that. So we tried to keep it as inexpensive as possible. So no matter what your financial situation is, uh, you don't have an excuse not to, not to be viewing this material and implementing. Yeah. Well, anyway, so I'll no, be remembered pretty, for my three cool. sons, but I'd rather be remembered for this because yeah, my three sons entertained a lot of people, but this is for all actors, you know, that are here right. now or are gonna be here. It's this it's the same proposition as it always was. Well, getting that I don't know why somebody cool. didn't do yeah, I don't know why it never you know always perplexed me that there wasn't something like that. You know, I saw it decades and decades ago that People coming here from New York, from, you know, uh, the actor studio, from Yale, you know, these prestige schools and not knowing anything about the business. And they're just lumped in like everybody else who just got here. In fact, that, that's good ideas. Don't come here at first. That's kind of what we, we teach people. You don't need to come here. You need to start where you are and, you know, get a feel for it, see how it works for you. Because you may decide you don't like it. You know, a lot of people think an acting career is one thing when it really isn't you know they they see all the parties the lights the glamour you know the girls the cars mansions and you know for 99.9 percent .9 of actors that's that's not their life they're struggling you know like to get their next interview or struggling to get an agent and how do yep. you get an agent um yeah so there's just so many things but you know there are things you can do to enhance your your prospects of accomplishing those tasks and uh it's not like you ever get into the position where you can relax because you know some of the people i had were known actors and then they hit a predicament it's like the agent that i just had for 38 years just dropped dead uh, well, how do i get an agent <laughs> you know right. or, or they drop you you know you get a letter from your agency saying your you know services are no longer needed and you know they might have looked at you and go you're you're a dinosaur not working enough for us to keep you on it's, it's a really crazy stuff goes on uh, right but, right you know we wanted to be totally transparent about all that all the stuff that can happen to you I and mean, we even cover the the advent that you become a star which comes with its own you know bunch of problems you know there's things that happen to people that become stars that shouldn't happen and you know can mm -hmm. do something about it preemptively if, if you're aware that that's what's going on uh, so yeah right. we covered everything soup to nuts well Hmm. So in fact, most people most people run with with blinders on so they just focus on what's in front of them instead of everything yeah. else that they need to pay attention to right yeah you know it's uh that that probably happens a lot you know they're all focused i just want to be an actor i don't want to know anything about business i don't want to know about my money i got a guy to do that you know and then you find out later yeah they had a guy that handled your money and guess what you don't have any money anymore he took it all and now you can't find him Right. so right you got to be involved at every level in your career and that's kind of what we're advising people you just really can't you know throw everything to somebody else to do or think that they're part of your team because they're not they're there to make money too and uh mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're making it off of you and when you quit making money they quit calling too so right yeah and you right. gotta have uh again you know, nerves of steel because the you know, the biggest thing you're going to be dealing with is rejection Mm -hmm. And but you know everybody in the beginning goes I can't get a part I keep getting rejected rejected you know I think I'm gonna have to get a shrink you know and they're taking it so personally <laughs> and well, you know I have to explain to them well you you saw this movie with this big director well unless he developed the film and was hired by the producer um, there were probably three other directors ahead of him that all got rejected yeah the top level so when you're being rejected you're being rejected with the best you know there's movies that tom hanks wanted and somebody else got or mel gibson and somebody else got it so mm -hmm. even at the upper echelon of the uh industry you know people right. are being rejected left and right so you know not that it makes it any easier but if you know they're getting whacked the same way you are somehow it makes it a little more palatable mm. yeah well, I mean, Jeff and I have always had the theory of, you know, you can't be afraid of that. You can't be afraid of rejection. You know, it's, it, it, yeah. it's part of it, but you have to train yourself, you know, how, yeah. how to deal with that and maybe how to use it, you know? Right, right. That, that's what you got to find is a creative way to do that. So, right. So uh, without that, you probably wouldn't be a complete actor. <laughs> you know, you really need to get your ass kicked. 
Yeah, and I, and I think that goes, and it's not just acting. I think that's in every every form of anything. You know, yes. I mean, we we started a, a, as writing a novel, to spun into comic book series and TV series, animation, and, and now the show. And a lot of people have asked us, well, how did you get so and so? Because we just walked up and asked. Yeah. Well, aren't yeah, you afraid they're going to say, say no? no? You know, You'd, and I always fall back on the a million times. Yeah, I, I fall back on the well, I, I'm married. I've been married for a long time. I hear <laughs> no a lot. So, yeah, yeah it, it, you can't let it bother you. You just got to move forward. Yeah, you just keep going. And it's just, you know, part of the game. And you, know, you can't take it too personal. And, you know, or you just weren't right for that thing. So, right, you know, right. Something else comes along. It's, it's, we just keep opening doors till you walk through the right one. Right. Uh, that's a hard concept because you know I've heard actors go, "Wow, I went in, it was my best interview ever. I get a killer reading, and but I didn't get the part." And what happened was you weren't the right actor. It wasn't going to make any difference. They know what they want. They kind of had something in their mind. And like I said, I walked in looking like me uh, in the last detail, and and in their mind they'd already decided they wanted to go with somebody like Randy Quaid. Well. I'm nothing like Randy Quaid. He's probably a foot taller than me, and you know he's kind of geeky looking. And, uh, yeah, it just right. that's the thing. So you you know you can't second guess anything. These guys you know know what they what they right. want. They know the second you walk through the door whether you're physically right, and then it's a matter of whether you can deliver a reading that they think is acceptable or that the director can work with or redirect you to do something else or you know. Actors make all kinds of crazy mistakes. You know, the guy is being interviewed to play the bad guy. You know, he comes into the interview, but he comes in and, you know, in the middle of the scene, he pulls out a big 12-inch long butcher knife. He's holding it up in front of the casting director and, and the director. And, you know, when he leaves, they're like, whoa, I don't ever want to see that guy again. <laughs> right? And nobody told them, wow, you know, you're not supposed to do that. Yeah, uh, you know you're a method actor, but you you don't bring weapons into the casting room. But people do, you know, yeah. thinking, oh well, they're gonna remember me, and yeah, they remember you. It's like, yeah, remember that guy? I don't ever want to see him yeah. again. Remember not to call him again. Yes, yeah, right. <laughs> lose that number. Yeah, yeah, and that's such a small circle of people. That's why I tell people you have to be extremely careful when you're in that room, what you do, what you say, because. Those casting people all know each other and share information. They'll go, hey, don't get this guy Charlie Smith in here. He just pulled out a butcher knife on us. Scared right. the director, scared the producer. Yeah, so well. we only have like a couple minutes left with this amazing gentleman. So, uh, Jeremy, do you have a last question? Uh, uh, I have an odd question. Uh, well, that doesn't surprise are, me. Are you watching, do you watch television and movies now? And if so, like, what's something that you would say, hey, this is something you guys should check out. You shouldn't miss this. Um, I, I can't really say I'm that guy. My mm. wife kind of advises me. She watches them. Go, oh, you got to see this. Uh, we saw a series last year that I thought was really it was it was different and it was really well done. Interesting casting. It was called Beef, B E E F. It just won awards, it, didn't it? Well, yeah, yeah. A lot of awards. Yeah. Well, if you saw it, you'd know why. The actors yeah. in it are tremendous. They're all Asian actors, Japanese, Korean, yep. Chinese. And yeah, it's a story of this girl who gets revenge on a guy who like backed into her car, almost hit her. And then mm. turns out she's the worst one. She's like the stalker after that, you know, and it's just this diminutive little Asian woman. And word goes is unbelievable. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but it was I so think well you're, done. And then, you're you the, know, yeah, you're the second one that has, has recommended that. Uh, Francesca De Luca. Yeah, I haven't seen it. Yeah. That was a yeah. while for me. Other than that, I don't want to say I'm stuck in the past, but I like to watch, you know, what they would probably show on Turner Classic Movies. I've got a lot of DVDs, and there's movies from my past that I just still enjoy watching, you know. Uh, I just watched uh, the original The Thing from 1951. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hadn't seen it in so long, and somebody uh, found me uh, finally a DVD of it. I love the Kurt Russell version, too, but uh, when I was a kid, I saw this, and it really scared me. And I thought it was interesting film because it was one of the first films done about, you know, the possibility of UFOs mm -hmm. and uh, which kind of began around the time of Roswell in 1947. But yeah, nobody did a movie about it, but this is, you know, a movie where the U S air force, you know, comes across something up at the North pole buried in the ice and 
it's got a, a human, well, a human like figure in it and they don't know what it is. Um, yeah, it's not any kind of graphic stuff like in the remake that John Carpenter did. And no, I love right, that. Right. I love that movie too. It just it's like the, the old scripts. original The Blob. Yeah, the, no, I just got right. that too. The guy that sent yeah. me the thing sent me The Blob. So oh, I'm nice. going to be watching that. But yeah, you know, um, this, well, the second thing was, I thought, really good. The guy, actually, the guy that wrote it was uh, Burt Lancaster's son, Bill Lancaster. And if you listen, that it's just the most sparse dialogue. It just tells you what you need to know or that stuff that would drive the characters. And, and it's, you know, got funny moments in it, but it's completely terrifying, especially if you've ever seen it in a theater. I, I went with a buddy of mine at the time when it came out. I used to be neighbors with Sherman Hemsley. So we decided to go see it one night at a theater. <laughs> he, he freaked out. He had to he go, man, I'm having like nightmares every night because of that part of <laughs> the thing that like turned into a head and grew legs and was crawling around like a spider. He kept, he goes, I'm having nightmares every night. Yeah, yeah that was a pretty, uh, pretty graphic movie, I have to say, but in, inventively so. Right. But yeah, I grew up with horror films and, you know, just being a kid in that era you know they had a monster i think it was a magazine called famous monsters magazine that was big came out about 1956 57 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and right outside the studio gate there was a restaurant called oblats and we would go there occasionally for lunch and they had a news rack and that was the first place i ever saw it and started collecting them every month but you know it was stories about the makeup guys on it and the tech technicians yep. that work on it, willis o'brien for king kong and um Jack Pierce, who did the Frankenstein makeup, and then stories about Lon Chaney and Lon Chaney Jr., Frankenstein, and it would yeah. get into the sci fi <laughs> stuff too. So I was always into that stuff and just yeah. uh, Henry Hall. It. Yeah. Henry Hall, yeah, yeah. We're Wolf of London. Well, yeah. guess what? At the beginning of uh, We're Wolf of London, it starts off when he's in Tibet looking for that plant or a flower there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the same place we shot that Kemper Insurance commercial. It's called Vasquez Rocks. <laughs> <laughs> you see the rock kind of going up at an angle. It's in so many movies, but it's right? a weird piece of That's geology funny. there from an earthquake. Thrust this piece of rock up. Wow. <clears throat> Excuse me. And yeah, if you watch, I must have seen that movie 10 times in my life. And suddenly I went, wait a minute that's Vasquez rocks this was to be tibet you know uh yeah it's amazing how much you know certain locations in la were used over and over again from you know, wow. shooting chem insurance commercials to werewolves running around on them <laughs> all righty jeffrey you got a you got a last question for this amazing gentleman before we um, have to let him go yeah because i get a bail pretty quick too um yeah. no i don't have a question i've got a uh a comment Okay. Wow. Okay. Uh, you know, as when I was a kid, you know, uh, my father, because I have two brothers, so there was three sons, and he used to at the beginning make us watch my three sons. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because it helped. <laughs> it, well, I think it had it, it made it easier for him dealing with three boys of his own. Yeah. Yeah. He you probably know identified I mean? with it. You he know, the show. If you say it, one thing. It was probably a good thing because the show, without being too preachy, really taught a lot of values, I think, to kids in a non-preachy way. Because like I said, the Fred McMurray character, you know, never grabbed a hold of us and go, oh, you little <laughs> kid, you do this or I'll, I'll punch your lights out or kick us in the ass. You know, he would say things and teach us and then expect us to learn from it or, mm -hmm. you know, to have an epiphany and go, oh, I did the wrong thing and, you know, come right. clean. But, you know, your dad probably saw that in the show and thought, hey, this guy's doing a better job than I could do. You know, and, and yeah, it's not like he wasn't, show. I mean, look, yeah, all the four of us would sit and watch, religiously watch that show. Well, that's one you of know? the things I think about shows out of that era that's different now. That's why people have, I think, such fond memories of those shows, in particular, My Three Sons. It's not so much the show. It's, it's how we watch them. Because mm -hmm. if it was like our house, you know, we had a, you know, a Dan, a rumpus room. And, mm -hmm. you know, I was there with my mom and my dad watching those shows. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't like mm -hmm. I was isolated in my bedroom like you are now or with your iPhone. or You know, no people don't get together like that. So it was kind of a, a family thing to watch television. 
And, you know, how many things can you think back on that you actually did with your family that you, you remember, you know, thing right. here, thing there, but television was just a, a big influence and a big factor in everybody's life. And it was something that the whole family gathered around a TV set, no matter what they were watching. Right. Yeah, but I, 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 did want, I, wanted, I wanted to tell you that. You know, that I appreciate a, that. Yeah. It's, a, it's a memory from when I was a little kid growing up. And uh, as soon as Ben told me that you were coming on, I was, it, it came back into my head. Yeah, it, you know? it always gives people the warm and fuzzies to think about where they were when they were watching the show. It's like you know, right. a lot of stuff I think about my parents then, and you know, we're all in there. My dad probably just went out and brought back a box of Chinese food. We're all sitting in there eating mm -hmm. Chinese food in front of the TV set watching, God, uh, could have been McHale's Navy or oh, you man. Know, weird. Wow. Yeah, different, uh, different TV shows of that era. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was. I mean, good for ones. me, I, I'm yep. in it, but I had the same experience you guys did. You know, was I was doing the same thing with my parents, and I think about watching all the stuff we watched. Uh, yeah, and in those days too, people generally only had one TV set, and the parents kind of controlled it to to a degree. And uh, you know, so we we're sort of forced to watch only one. I I kind of drew the line. It was Lawrence Wilk. I didn't want to watch that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not watching that. <laughs> Come on. You didn't yeah. like the bubbles? Not the bubbles. No. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. My three sons was almost not really my three sons. My three sons was almost my three daughters. And the three daughters were, what was it, the Lennon sisters or whoever was on there, McGuire sisters. On there. It was three girls that performed on that show for Lawrence Welk. And Don <laughs> Federson, the guy who was producing My Three Sons, his original idea was to do a show called My Three Daughters. And they were in negotiations with the guy who was going to play the father, which was Eddie Albert. And the McGuire sisters backed out of it. They didn't want to leave the Lawrence Wilk show. So it went down the drain for a while, I think, until Don Pedersen saw a movie called uh, The Shaggy Dog. And it had Fred McMurray in it. It had Tim Considine in it. Uh, but it had Tommy Kirk and Kevin Corcoran as the two other brothers. The only thing missing was you know the bub the grandfather uh it mm -hmm. even had a dog it had hobo the one that turned into the shaggy dog so yeah wow. i think he got the idea of that and approached fred uh redesigned the show to be my three sons and uh right around that time our worlds uh you know collided and collided i, I came from ozzy and harriet in those movies and don grady was just getting started he was a musketeer and i think he was just in a movie called mob Barker's horrible brood Check your or phone something. Then. Huh? Yep. yep. Something's going on. Oh my god. No, I really need to go. So okay. okay. Uh, yep. Yep. I I hate to do that, but yeah, that's things all right. that are yeah, happening. Well, all right. All right. Things that are happening. Well, we'll uh, but I want again. thank you. Thank you, Stanley. I really, yes. really appreciate it. It's been a it's been a great show. I loved hearing the stories and uh I'm gonna to have to go back and watch some of those episodes all over again now. I think they're right. up on YouTube. Well, they, I think you know, they committed. I can, yeah, I can find them. Yeah, I yeah. can definitely find them. So, but sorry, I got to run, but I definitely have to run. No problem. All right. All right. So, take Thanks, go ahead. Jaja. You can go. So, uh, anyway, Stanley, um, where do you like folks interacting with you on social media? Uh, well, I have four Facebook pages, so any one of those, I, you know, I post things to, uh, not daily, but, you know, um, fairly often, you know, or if I'm doing something, I post it there. But most people come to my website. I have a, you know, I guess you call it a fan website, and it's mm -hmm. at stanleylivingston.com. And uh, it's got everything about my career there, all the movies that I could think of that I was in, all my credits. Uh, I kind of did it. It's an homage to My Three Sons, too. So there's a lot of information about My Three Sons there. Uh, you know, a lot of historical stuff, a uh, list of all the people that were in it, whoever appeared on My Three Sons, a list of all the big movie stars who were on the show or were yet to be to have big careers like Bull Bridges and Martin Sheen, Sally Kellerman, um, jo uh, Jodie Foster. Wow. Uh, yeah. And then all the different directors that we had and some of their work, you know, the last director we had was Fred de Cordova, who went on um, to be the producer of Johnny Carson for 20 years. And wow. he was a formidable guy in the industry and knew everybody. That's probably why Johnny Carson wanted him. But yeah, he was a fun guy to work with. Um, yeah. And then uh, Gene Reynolds went on to do MASH and Lou Grant and 
Room 222. So yeah, most of these people went on to bigger fame and fortune after they uh, left my two son. The guys who were on behind the scenes. You know, my boss was John <laughs> Stevens. He was literally the producer, line producer of the show, but he went on to do Simon and Simon, uh, Major Dad, uh, a lot of How the West was one as a TV series. So yeah, you know, these guys had pretty good careers too. And some became mentors to me, like that guy, John Stevens. I knew him literally his whole, well, from the time I met him, I guess I was 10, he was 22, but we remained friends until he passed away not too long ago. Wow. Same thing with Fred de Cordova. Um, yeah, so it's, it's just. That's awesome. Yeah, it's been an experience, <laughs> you know, and right. between that and the movies. Yeah. You know, when I did like how the West was one, that was that was kind of cool. But uh, usually once a year, but it's shut down now. I guess COVID wiped it out. But we had a uh, Cinerama theater in Hollywood called the Art Light Theater. And the Art Light is where they would run how the West was one. And they restored it back in 2010. And. Anyway, there weren't a lot of people left alive who were in it, so they called me to see if I would come down and talk to the audience before and introduce the, the movie and tell a couple stories about making it and about working with Henry Hathaway, who was the director of the uh, the segment that I was in, uh, was divided into thirds. John Ford was one of them, George Stevens, and Henry Hathaway were three directors. So, yeah, you know. Well, wow. life just keeps happening. <laughs> right. So, folks, you can check the show notes up above or down below, depending on where you're watching and listening. All that information is in there, including the website. So, uh, oh. oh, okay. Bye. <laughs> Jeremy. <laughs> hey, uh, check out Splash Pages on YouTube and Facebook every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern. And, uh, also, check out The Re-Education of Nancy Ann Ritter on uh, YouTube. It, it's a great little horror show that I've uh, been doing for a little while. And uh, if you are into buying, selling, and trading comic books, check out Comic Book Lovers Buy, Sell, Trade, and Auction House on Facebook. And that's it. Good night. <laughs> it's just oh, I, oh, I don't like now. that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I want to thank, uh, you know, Stanley. I, I, I would assume his phone died. That's why he went bloop. Mm -hmm. um, Jar Jar, I want to thank you for coming and hanging out and helping out tonight. To all our veterans and first responders, I want to thank you for doing what you do so people like us can do what we do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I said. So, uh, yeah. I guess uh, that's it. We'll see you next Wednesday. Be safe. So come on. Hey.